animation fans, and welcome to another iAnimate podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez, and you're listening to episode 46. In this episode, we have guest and instructor, Kevin Rucker. Uh, Kevin's been teaching here at our games workshop for about four (laughs) years-ish. He's been working in the game industry for quite some time. He's currently a senior animator at Blizzard Entertainment down in Irvine, California. Um, Before that, he worked at uh, such companies as Blue Sky, where he worked on the Ice Age 3 movies, and uh, Ready at Dawn, where he worked on some of the God of War series there. Um, He was a cinematic lead on the highly anticipated game, The Order 1886, for the PS4 at Ready at Dawn. Um, And as I mentioned, he's been one of our instructors for quite some time. And so I'm just really looking forward to talking with him in regards to his uh, philosophy, his uh, teaching style, and just how he approaches animation. And so uh, let's bring him on. Hey. Hey, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Good. So first off, I always like to thank my guests for showing up. I I know um, life is busy. You've got a family. You've got work. So I really do just appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know our guests love hearing the uh, the podcast. I get a lot of compliments on it. So thank you very much for joining us in this podcast. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I like to jump into – I always kind of feel like it's a good starting off point because uh, you know, here we are in this medium of animation that we all love. But how we kind of get there, everybody's kind of has their own little story here. So I just kind of like to find out, you know, how you got into animation. Were you one of those kids that loved to draw, or is that something that kind of, you know, uh, the idea of animation and graphics kind of came later for you, or how did that work? How did you get into animation? Why did you want to do it? And maybe what was your education to to kind of start getting you in the door? Yeah, um, I think as far as I can remember, I've always been, I've always drawn in school. I went to a pretty small. Um, private school growing up, and there was like two of us in the class who could draw. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and my dad was really encouraging, even now, I mean, he's encouraging with art. He he did photography as a kid and made this decision after college to do, to, to be a salesman, to because it just followed the kind of the money and opportunity, so he kind of left that passion behind. So he's always encouraged us kids, his kids, to kind of go for what we really enjoyed. So I had the cool pencils and sketchbooks and stuff, and he, for like a 10-year-old, having cool stuff like that. It was, I think I was uh, probably 12, 13. I got, I got really into Disney movies, and I, and I think I figured out I wanted to be a Disney animator around that age. And I would draw, I did it all wrong. I would grab, um, like, these books and pictures, and I would draw Disney characters. And I say all wrong because when you want to be an animator, you're supposed to draw from life and draw everything, not just copying Mickey Mouse and Tinkerbell and stuff. But I just did that a lot. It was a lot of fun. Uh-huh. And then all the way through junior high, really concentrated on art in high school. I took the, like all the kind of as many art classes I could take. I didn't. <laughs> I took a practice SAT, but I didn't take the actual SAT because I soon figured out I wanted to go to the Academy of Art College, it's Academy of Art University now. Uh, and you didn't have to take an SAT when you went there, so. You did or didn't? I did not. Okay. So I didn't. <laughs> no, no math class, no took a writing class, took one history class. It was all just art. Uh, so yeah, I want to be a Disney animator. So I graduated high school and started the Academy of Art. That summer I graduated. A lot of it was drawing, drawing classes, um, figure drawing classes and painting. Um, later on was storyboard and some layout stuff. And then it was it was all uh, all all hand drawn stuff. I want to be a Disney animator, and at that time Disney animation was starting to go down. Tarzan was out and it was awesome. I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. And then they had Atlantis and some other ones that were kind of okay. And Home on the Range was oh my gosh, Home on the Range. And then the <laughs> animation was going to be dead after that. Um, then at that time also I figured out I wasn't awesome at drawing and it wasn't really that fun. So. Um, I started taking electives in Maya. Um, I took it was three or four Maya classes, and it, the, how that works, you took Maya one, Maya two, and it was kind of everything. Fourteen weeks of you learn how to model and rig and texture and all that, and then at the very end, the last two weeks or week, you animated what you this creature thing. Well, you can learn it all you need to know in two weeks, for animation, yeah, that's, right? that's it. <laughs> you can animate, you're, you're great. So I remember taking the teacher's rig and then animating on top of that. And then after that, I kind of still learned that stuff, but I was just, I just want to animate. And I don't really know why, I don't know what it is about animation. I remember as a kid, I told my wife this the other day, that I used to play G.I. Joe's as a kid, like uh-huh. I all did. And I remember um, 
like one guy was up here shooting another guy, and when he got shot, I'd, I'd kind of move them and fall. And I remember seeing a commercial the other day of some kids playing with some toys, and he did the same thing. So I wonder <laughs> if it's just, it was like I was almost puppeteering the character. So yeah, yeah. Maybe about mov- movement or something that, that I really enjoyed. Um, Maya 1, 2, and then later on they had these classes called Maya for Traditional Animators, and they provided a rig for you, and then you, for the 14 weeks of class, you you planned out and you animated these different shots, a weight lift, or you know, object, lifting an object and a little acting thing and a head turn and kind of your standard kind of practice things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I had a really awful reel, and I thought I can work at Pixar or something. <laughs> like what version of Maya was it? Uh, Maya 4. Okay. 4 or 4.5 back then. It was 2001, I think it was. I went to, it was college. I went in 99. So, okay. And I had no it's like computer. I didn't like it. Pixar stuff was, I mean, Pixar was awesome at the time, but people who were doing CG stuff, like it was all bubbly and geometry smashed into other. Like, what? It, like, I'm looking at Tarzan. It's like, that's, this is awesome. Uh-huh. I'm not. What is this computer stuff? I didn't. I just didn't get it. I met a guy there trying to be a, a pretty good friend, and he um, he wanted to do the CG stuff, and it was all CG, and I wanted to do the 2D. Um, so he's trying to get me to maybe do 3D and 2D, and we talked about doing a short together or some kind of thing. Where who's better, 2D or 3D? And look, <laughs> I can, look what I can do. And it never panned out because I wasn't, I couldn't draw. But so I'm really glad I took these these 3D classes. Yeah, that's kind of the college thing. So how did you get into some of your first gigs? So the first gigs, so when I graduated, uh, I couldn't find a job. And then I got a, I, I was soon married after I graduated. A couple months later, we got married. And then I worked at this um, this laptop company in this kind of warehouse for a year. And then it was a good, it was a perfect schedule. I worked from 7 to 4. I'd get home and i just kind of animate. And my buddy, Jake, his name's Jacob Patrick. He's down here in L.A. doing writing and all kinds of stuff. Mm. He wanted directing and um, he's like an idea guy. He wants to do shows and make movies and stuff. He's ambitious. He had a job at Sony Computer Entertainment. And he taught me how to make animation for games. <clears throat> for games, excuse me. Um, for those listening over here, Kevin's taking a nice big gulp. <laughs> hey, my throat's getting dry. It's like five <laughs> plus. And at the time, it was, it's funny. Nowadays, it's very different because everyone wants to work at a game company. But back then, it's like the games were the low. And I think some people still think that. Like film, film's the highest. And I think a lot of people talk about this. And, and games were like kind of the lowest thing. But back in, I mean, 2000 and something, games didn't look like they do now. Right, right. But by then, 2004, 2005, God of War was coming out. I'm like, what is this? This <laughs> looks awesome. Yeah, the PlayStation 2. So he showed me how to do animate for games. You, I make an idle uh, run cycles, walk cycles, how to do an attack. Um, you start in a pose and you do it really quickly, um, really fast anticipation. You, you hit your hit frame and then you go to your end in the same pose in the same spot kind of thing. So he showed me kind of how to do that and that kind of turned into a job with him on the cinematic team. So it was took a year working on this stuff on my own and then I got he got me a gig at Sony. That's cool. Uh, on a PlayStation 2 game. It was a it was um, a Jet Li. It was a sequel to Rise of the Honor. Okay. And eventually, after I had it for three months, they laid off a bunch of people. It shifted from PlayStation 2 to PSP, which was new at the time. And it was funny, because I, I remember my mom called that day. I'm packing up this my stuff in this box. <laughs> my mom goes, oh, how's your day going? I was like, oh, I got laid off. She thought it was a joke. <laughs> it was funny. I wasn't really mad or upset. They had some. There was another guy on the team that got hired at the same time as me, and he came in, and he was saying goodbye. Uh, he felt really bad, and I was like, "No, no, no don't, don't worry about it, man. It's, it's these things happen." I don't know why at the time I was, I was so cool about it. Um, but then after that, it was five months. I, I was looking for, looking for work. I had, so it already took me a year to get a job with this kind of, um, okay. I don't even know what the animation looks like now. These attacks, I gotta look for them. They probably look horrible. <laughs> It's like Ninja Run Cycle. <laughs> I couldn't really show the stuff that I was working on at, at Sony. But then I got in contact with his headhunter. I didn't even know what a headhunter at the time. I, I emailed this company. Oh, we're looking for animators. And I sent them my stuff. And I got a call the next day. And I was all excited. But it turns out they're going to look for a job. Well, five months later, sending my stuff out, um, a company called The Collective down in Newport Beach. Because I was up at, still in the Bay Area at the time. Mm. And The Collective um, wanted to do a phone interview and, and turn out to hire me. 
and I worked on a Dirty Harry game for, and I was there for a year, and it was, it was, <laughs> and it was their first, um, their first next gen game was Xbox 360. It turns out I, they had some layoffs and I left that company and then eventually the game got canceled. But in that year, I learned well, I had a really good lead named Paul. He's at ID right now. He's where? He's at ID. Okay. He worked on uh, the, the new Doom. Okay. And he is a crazy Canadian dude. He's awesome. And <laughs> workflow. I, I would, I used to work with, um, you start on frame one, and I always doing this walk cycle, and then you kind of pose the character. You go to frame two, and you kind of pose the character in frame three. But then he took my really terrible walk cycle this one time, and, and he did this technique, and a lot of people do, is you select the whole entire character, all the controls, and then you key. So he found, like, a key pose in my animation, and he keyed it, and then found the next key pose and keyed it, and took all the other stuff in between and just deleted it. Uh-huh. Like, well, you're doing my animation. <laughs> but if you have the right... And the stuff I teach now. If you have the right pose, and, the, and you have the right poses and the right timing, um, it'll just work out um, to a certain extent. I mean, there's a lot of in betweens you got to do, but I mean, it really changed everything. Yeah. Uh, all the he had used um, the shortcuts and all these little tricks. He would do something. He would. I'd sit at his desk and he'd take my animation and kind of work with it. And he'd do something in my. It's like, well, what, what did you do? It's like, oh yeah, you middle click and you can copy and paste. Like, well, what? Um, marking menus, just quick access to things and hotkeys and bouncing between the beginning and end of the timeline to rewind and, and things I still use now and things I teach my students to this day, but it's, it, it really changed everything. So that was, let's see. So I got the job at Sony February of 05 for a couple of months and then I started the collective, um, that August of 05 and I was there for a year. And then, uh, then I went to Ready at Dawn. I met this guy named Chuck who worked at, um, he worked at, um, Insomniac for a bunch of years and he came to the collective. And then he left the collective and went to this Ready at Dawn studio. At the time, it was like, I didn't know, no one knew what Ready at Dawn was. They uh-huh. made this game called Daxter on PSP. Well, the collective was going to have some layoffs and I was getting freaked out because I got laid off before. So I just messaged him one day. I said, hey, dude, they're having layoffs. What do I do? He says, hey, give me your reel and I'll show it around here. So then I think this must have been a Monday and then he showed him my reel and they really liked it. And, um, he gave me a call back and he says, Hey, they want you to come in. They want to talk to you. So I think the next day by Tuesday or Wednesday, a couple days later, I went in for an interview. I talked with the guys, um, showed them my stuff again. We don't have to lunch and they offered me the job right there at lunch. <laughs> and I was gone by that Friday. I talked to, it was cool. I mean, I talked to the animation director. Uh, super cool guy, and I told him my situation. He kind of understood. And he says, "Well, and I was going to give two weeks." So he's like, no, "No, you can leave a little early if you want." So Monday, and then Friday, I was Friday. gone, and I wow. started ready at dawn. And um, it was '06, so September of 2006. Now, what titles did you work at Ready at Dawn? Ready at Dawn, um, they I got hired, and we were working on the God of War: Chains of Olympus for PSP. Okay. So they're working with. So after they did Daxter, they talked with Sony to try to figure out what else they can do. And at the time, God of War 2, God of War was already out, and they're huge fans of it on PS2. Then they're working on another God of War. And so Ready Dawn says, hey, we can make a God of War for PSP. And I think Sony thought, oh, we'll do, you'll do the portable version of it, like a side scroll or something. And then they're like, no, 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 we'll do a full game. And that's what they did. It was the same kind of camera, crazy environments, all the awesome attacks and... So it was. So when I was at Sony and God of War One came out, and we're thinking, "What is this game?" Uh-huh. I remember playing God of War One and just watching the run cycle and his attacks, um, and it was it was so awesome. So I had <laughs> never dreamt that I would be working on that kind of game. That's pretty cool. Did you see the uh, new uh, was it t- uh, trailer they showed for uh, E3? Yeah, yeah, that That's, was pretty insane. Yeah, they're doing the the third person stuff is coming back. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's like Dark Souls kind of thing, which is like the camera behind. Their, the, um, God of War was different. They had uh, it was all on, I think they call it a scripted camera. So, uh, depending on the the level you're in, you might be the camera might be behind, following Kratos behind in a hallway. But if you turn around, he'll just run towards the camera. And if you go back to the this outside environment, the camera will kind of snap back, and you'll just run around. So it's very this since it's a fighting game, you need to be able to see everything like this. Where you're fighting, 
So the new game is very different, but I'm sure it's going to be it'll look really good. Yeah, it look, and you're like an old man. And, it looked pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's that would be that'd be a good. <laughs> so you were at uh, Ready at Dawn for a bit here. You worked on two God of War titles. Yeah, so we did. Yeah, the Go- Chains of Olympus, and then um, eventually we did Ghost of Sparta, which was a sequel. Okay. Oh no. Yeah, it was the it was I think it was supposed to take place between one and two, I think. So uh, Chains of Olympus was a prequel to kind of God of War one, and then I think Chains of Olympus or Ghost of Sparta was between one and two, kind of in the story. Any pressure working on this title here? Obviously, there was a big success with the console version. Yeah, I think um, graphically they had a they had a big. That was a big deal on the first one. They uh, PSP normally ran at 222 megahertz to save battery life, and then they they talked to Sony to unlock the full 333, which sounds so small right now. <laughs> uh, but at the time, it was a it was a big deal because we can get the better frame rate and the lighting was better and the shadows and all that. Yeah, it was it was a big deal. We had at that time we only had God of War one two. Um, to compare it to, and I think, I can't remember if God of War 2 came out first, or if Chains of Olympus came out, um, but y- yeah, we had, so Sony came down, and they had, we had to make sure it kind of fit, um, fit the world, there was kind of this, this idea of how Kratos moves, and we had to kind of follow that, but since all the creatures were new, I mean, we had, I mean, I was a nobody at the time, I mean, I still am a nobody, but <laughs> more or less of a nobody, so I think there was a lot of freedom. I think we, uh, it was funny. We would actually play the game and then trying to figure out how there's this thing called the CS or context sensitive, context sensitive moves where you, when you get a, um, you're fighting like a, a big cyclops and then you get his health low enough and there's like a circle prompt above his head uh-huh. and then you, can, you go up and hit circle and you grab him and you do this crazy move and you climb up and then it's like a mini game where you're supposed to hit the right button at the right time and then you just continue. So it was like you'd animate the character's move set, the idols and runs and attacks and all that, and then the end is like the, the awesome stuff. For <laughs> and I, I get to kill it somehow. I remember animating this the um, Cyclops attack. He climbed, the, it initiated, and you, I think you cut him in his stomach, and he comes back. I mean, it looks horrible now, but you hit the <laughs> ground, you climb up his arm, and you stab him in the shoulder, and he stabs him in the eye. It's horrible. I mean, violent, but it was at the time it was really fun. Hey, he's the bad guy, right? He's the bad guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then you, and then you get to kill him. But anytime you messed up one of these button presses, that you can fail. So we would play the game and try to figure out: is this how you do these? I guess so. But then later on, we'd find out that we did it all wrong. But I mean, it, it worked out pretty well because <laughs> I think they're busy with their game, we're busy with ours. But um, and then Ghost of Sparta was a was a it was. It was awesome to work on. It didn't sell really well. I think the first one came out just the right time, and it, and it was awesome. But the second one, I think just the PSP life cycle was kind of coming down. Uh, and the other thing, they kept comparing it. Then God of War 3 was coming out on PlayStation 3. Okay. And they kept comparing it. It was really funny. They'd say, oh, God of War 3 looks better. I was like, yeah, it looks better. It's not PS3. It's like awesome. On a PSP. So we took that as a compliment. Like ah, oh, it does. It looks pretty good, but not quite as good. Right? <laughs> okay, and I think it it was downloaded. You can you can download PSP games too okay. easily back then. Um, oh, okay, okay, I got you. Yeah, so it was, I think the before it was even sold, it was downloaded like a half a million times. Like Gosh. oh, guys, nice. It's, it's, you really enjoy these games, but you're taking money away from people who make them. Gosh, that's that's it's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of time and energy put into those things. Yeah, so then we didn't make any more because we didn't make money. Congratulations, pirates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get hacked. Uh, yeah, so that, those two, and there were some other prod, other things that kind of came and came. Uh, we kind of started and keep us busy, and then the order was the next big one that I was working on. Um, I was the cinematic lead on that game. Okay. It was a big deal. Um, but I was on it just for a couple of years, and then I left to come to Blizzard. I was, only, I was on it for two years. You say just a couple of years, like, ah, it's, you know, it's a couple of weeks there, you know. That's a long time. Two years on one, yeah, on a project? Yeah. yeah. It was a brand new, I'm trying to figure out, let's see, the first God of War was not maybe a year? Oh, man, I'm really bad with dates. And the second one, maybe a couple years, maybe less. That Ready Dawn at the time, they totally skipped the current. They went from PSP 
they skipped PlayStation 3 and they went straight to PS4. Right, yeah. And it was all new, all new game, new IP, new everything. It's like yeah. we're going to cinematics with crazy facial capture and mocap. And, it's amazing looking. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was ridiculous. It, it was, I think we, we would, we were shocked. Like we, we would work on it and it's like when you're working on, they're building a level and it looks all cool and you kind of run through these, they're called pre-mod levels where you run, they're working on a cover and then you, um, just run around just gray boxes. And then just to see if the gameplay works. Uh-huh. And when you add art, it just makes it a little better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you see these levels going in the games. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Water and, um, I know frame rate was a thing back then, but they figured that out. I actually have, I've played, no, I haven't played. I've seen it played online. I actually haven't played it yet. I have a copy of it, but I don't have a PlayStation 4. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to do you. No, uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think some, some friends at work have been borrowing it, but I like to play it. Someday. It looked very, very cool. I love the style too, that kind of um, industrial steampunkish uh, right. genre. Um, but yeah, it looked absolutely amazing. Yeah, it was. It, I think it's won a few awards. Yeah. Or I think gameplay wise, they got some hit, but it's it's tricky when you compare it to games you think it might be like. Like, oh, it's not a Gears of War, and it's not a this. Like, uh, I think they're trying to create like a an experience, a, a whole story and like, oh, there's a level where you just hit one button. It's like, well, then you just hit one button, right? You, th- That's what you do. And then you move on and you shoot some stuff and you, there's like kind of a whole story experience that you're going with. And, gotcha. Oh, yeah, and it looks really good. So that's a part of it, right? But it's tricky to, to really know. Like, there's some movies, right? Yeah. I mean, I, did Iron, like Iron Giant, did that do really well? In the theater, right, maybe right. it did. I'm not exactly sure, but you look back, it's like it's amazing. Right, so right. You never know. I yeah. Think. So you're a cinematic lead on that one. Yeah. Now, cinematic was that, lead. Huh? Was that new for you? Because it sounded like for the most part your background was in actual in-game animation. Yeah. It. I was. There was another little project that was starting up that I was on, and then that didn't go anywhere. And then so they put me on. I was kind of a lead, like an in-game lead, and they put me on. Um, the God of War game, and they they already had a lead animator. I was like, I don't know, I'll just animate. I don't need to be a lead. Um, so we worked and finished that. Well, the lead animator at the time, he's still there. He was going to be a lead in game, and they said, Well, you'll co you'll co lead it. It's like, <laughs> what? No, no, I don't I don't think so. Um, either have him do it, or I'll do something else. Like, cinematic. They want to do a huge cinematic. So, if we're going to do that, we can't split that. So, well, why don't I just do cinematics and then he can do in-game. Uh-huh. He's really good at system design and all that. And I'll do... And I really enjoy the camera camera kind of animation on the God of War stuff, and I'll just keep doing that. So, I was... I did a lot of first um, the pre So, we would get the script... We'd get the script from um, the creative director, and then we'd, we'd record. I had another guy on the team named Daniel. He, he took over for me when I left. But he knew, oh, we did Motion Builder too. He was my Motion Builder teacher. And uh, we would take the script and record scratch dialogue, like in this in this room. It's not, I was horrible at it. <laughs> but it was enough to, to get the lines down, and I would chop it up in this whatever sound program. So, we hang had. on, so you're doing the voice work? Yeah, we're doing the voice work. <laughs> we're doing the voice work. I don't think we had any girls, so I didn't have to do like a girl voice. But, uh, we had to kind of change the voice a little bit just to get an idea of the cinematic. So, and I chop up all the lines and I'd plug them in, and it was really, it was really fun. I would start out by timing. I don't know how did I do it. I put the characters in the scene. It was all in Motion Builder on the tracks editor, or whatever they called it. And I would put a camera in the scene with the characters just kind of standing there. And I would do just basic posing, just head turns and stuff, nothing too serious, just like a normal, really kind of a low, low res previs. Okay. Um, and then I would kind of put characters in the scene and set up the shot how I how I thought would look cool. And then I would start putting dialogue in there. And then okay, I think this guy's gonna walk over here and turn and say this line. So then I build a bunch of lines and then animate them saying their lines. And then I would add more lines. So I'd kind of go back and forth as I'm kind of creating this stuff. And Motion Builder has a really cool thing called a shot cam, I think it's called, where you dump, you can dump in a bunch of cameras. Okay. And then, like, you're kind of doing your coverage. Um, and then you kind of have this Uber cam, Maya calls it Uber cam, 
where you can kind of select what camera you want to look through and for how long. So you can kind of just put camera A, camera B in the scene and then edit it at the same time. Like I'll be at camera A until this time, then it's going to switch to camera B. Just they'll have two cameras and then one will just kind of parent to the other one and bounce around the scene. So at the end of the cinematic, you might have 30 cameras in the scene, but then you'd have this one kind of bounce through. It was really cool. That's neat. And then we take that and make it, and once that got approved, we'd make a um, like a video of it, and we'd take that down to the mocap stage in San Diego on an iPad, and they would ref- refer to that when they're trying to set up the shot. Now, they had um, the two directors, the game directors there, on, on the stage, so I was like, if you want the guy to be happy or sad, or uh, that's you guys, I don't... But as far as... They had me there for more technical. Like, we need to have the guy to end through the door here because gameplay has to take over. He needs to stop and turn left because of this. You know, just technical uh-huh. direction. But you basically have to direct it, though, uh, with the cameras yeah. and stuff. I didn't really direct the people. No, I'm talking about, like, the cameras and stuff like oh, that, yeah. though. So you, you were kind of a director in that sense. Yeah, I think so. That's cool. Because they would... Um, because he would just kind of come up with a script and maybe have an idea, or sometimes not even that. It was it was really tricky because I'd make a previs, make the kind of the whole little scene, which might be two or five minutes long, uh-huh. and then they'll say, "Oh no, let's do this, this." So I'd have to change a lot of it, okay. which kind of was stinky, but at least they could stinky. <laughs> <Pardon my language. laughs> hey, watch yeah, watch your language here. <laughs> um, but it, it, what happened? It gave him something to look at, and it's not like I was su- super pressed for time. I was <laughs> so pretty crazy over there. What? I said, I'm sorry, that's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we got kids, so that's like, bad, a tummy right. ache, like a tummy ache? Like, ah, yeah. uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, but it was um, so it was tricky to kind of have to redo it, but in the end, it, it, I was hopefully able to make something that they liked. Right. Looking back now, it's I mean, you're right. I guess I was able to kind of help direct the scene. But then from there, they'd shoot the actors, and then... Um, Things would kind of come up, uh, uh, other ideas, and then later on they take all the footage, and then down at San Diego, this awesome camera guy, Pablo Chavez, and he would go through with a mocap kind of camera in their room, and then start just shooting coverage with his camera, kind of loosely based on what I did, uh-huh. but something you know, the timing would change, we'd have happy accidents, and I would sit in there um, with them. I'd ride down to San Diego again, and I'd just sit with them. And he had this other guy working with him for more of the technical aspect. And they would just shoot coverage and then export the scene from there. And then that's how they'd kind of process the mocap from that data. Okay. Um, but I would kind of, again, I'd kind of direct, but I was just relaying what the directors wanted. So it was like a technical liaison. But, that was, I mean, that was fine. I don't mind. Again, with my class, um, I'm sure we'll talk about this more no, later. Bring it up. I like hearing it's, this. It, it's tricky because... Um, you try to find good ideas, and hopefully I was able to relay what the directors wanted, not just what... Because I don't want what I want, usually, because I don't know if it's good, but you try to find a good idea. Like, the student will have an idea for... Like, we do, like, a run cycle or death animation. Like, oh, it'd be cool if they did this. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, trying to keep their idea, but then if if something really needs to change to make it stronger, I'd suggest it, but... If it's something I wouldn't do, then that's fine. I, it, I don't have to have it my way, and that's... That's good. That's a good attitude, because that's not always easy in a, an artistic environment. Yeah, because um, I, I, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Hopefully I have some. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the things I like about work now, um, being a lead was a really good experience, but I think where I'm strongest on a team is... To, um, like I think you have the Steve Jobses and then you have the Wozniaks or the Walt Disney's and the Ub Iwerks. Like I think I'm the Iwerks for the Wozniak. Like you just you have the vision and then you tell me what you want to happen and hopefully. Like the, the joke was, you know, for my position, Rue was the was the crea- one of the owners at Ready Done. And then the pr- production director said, "You just make Rue's idea look good." I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's was perfect. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, back to uh, the order here, though, because uh, maybe I didn't, I didn't quite get that here. This is. Did you animate much in the uh, on the cinematics for these two years? I. Let me say two years. What did I do? 
<laughs> for the let's see for the cinematic part eventually when we got in the groove of production no okay. I did Revis um, and then the mocap I was on the mocap stage I go down they call it wow they call it edits because they shoot a ton of mocap and then from the camera edits they figured out exactly what they should process so I went down there for that just to help supervise that supervise I mean help with that and then I went back down there for the camera stuff and then the editing so I I did a lot of that and then down at Sony we're working with a facial um, like a guy who did a lot of the facial poses mm-hmm. for the model the blunt shapes and then they had the cinematic team so they're I mean, they have their their stuff figured out down there. It's awesome. So they have a producer just kind of walking down around. The, Sony San Diego? Sony, yeah. Visual Arts Service Group, it's called. Uh. Um, in San Diego, they do Uncharted Cinematics. And they okay. Do it. So they would walk me around, and then I they would say, just to get approvals. I'm like, approvals? Okay. Yeah. This is kind of neat. Um, so I did, I did that, and a lot of phone calls, and we had some other companies we were working with, I guess, supervising that in a way. Okay. But animation, early on, we did some more animation to kind of discover the style of the game. Okay. Decided to do more. But yeah, I did some animation in the game. I animated this bridge falling down and uh, maybe a couple other things, but not not much. My main thing was just previous. Because you worked on Ice Age 3, right? Oh, yeah. I was just kind of wondering what your transition was in regards to doing more of the uh, in-game animation to something more cinematic slash uh, working on Ice Age, where it was... Not in-game animation. Oh so yeah, what no. your transition was for that, and how you were you comfortable jumping into that, or or. Yeah. So after after um, it was 2008. After we shipped uh, Chains of Olympus, we didn't. I don't think we had a project at the time, and then we we're working on this other kind of idea, uh, which is a lot of fun. A lot of little animation stuff going on. Um, well, in the meantime, I sent a reel to Blue Sky because they're looking for temp animators. And I just, like, I'll just throw something out there. And I got an email from a guy, and then he, they wanted to bring me on as a temp. Um, kind of a long story of how that happened. But, um, so I kind of reluctantly, but I, it was one of those decisions where it was really hard to, to, to leave the company because I really liked it. Um, but in August, it was August, August or September of 08, I left. And I thought at the time, oh, cool, I did my in-game thing, and now I'm going to do a movie thing. So I was, still, I was married at the time, my wife was pregnant, and then I moved out. <laughs> she stayed here because she was still working. Okay. So out to New York when the, it was still in White Plains. So I lived in this extended stay hotel for three months, and I worked um, Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Okay, okay. It was, it, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we can talk about that. It was, it was a really good experience. I wouldn't do it now because you know family. And stuff. Right, right. Uh, but at the time, if I could go back, I would, st- I'd still do it. And I even now I recommend anyone who wants to get into movies or anything, try to get the temp job. I think it's like this famous thing, the temp job at Blue Sky. Because I don't know, since they're out on the East Coast, it's harder to get people or something. But, um, but it's crazy. I, I sent in a reel, and then they hired me, and they said, yeah, come out, and we'll. I took a huge pay cut to do it, but. Um, but the hotel thing was free, and then yeah, there's no interview. Excuse me, no interview, no test. It was really weird. But yeah, the first shots, <laughs> the first shots I worked on were like like a deer looking, like all these like one second reaction shots. Um, and then eventually, you know, you do well on those because they have plenty of those to do. But then if you do well on those, there you you can kind of get bumped up to some pretty better, you know, better. Shots. Right, right. So I got like a 90 frame one with Manny in it, and I got a, kind of a longer one, a Crash and Eddie shot. I mean, all together, I think I animated like 40 seconds or something. No, maybe less than that. Um, but the the it was from September, and it would have gone till March of 08 or 09. Um, but we're gonna have a baby, and and um, my seven year old is gonna be born in April. So. I came back during the Christmas break in, in December when they when they moved to Connecticut. Then I just left because they took a big break for a week, and then I just didn't come back. Did you tell anybody? Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm kidding. kidding. I'm kidding. kidding. Like, I told them, and they're like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> and then later on, they called. I think after the baby was born, um, they called to offer me a full time job out there, which oh, was yeah. kind of really cool. But um, it was my 
my my parents' seventh grandkid, but then it was my wife's parents, my in-laws' first. First, grandkid. gotcha. So I I, I I turned it down. But got a different experience though, which is pretty. Yeah, cool. it, it was. Yeah, it was. Just working on a movie, I think, was hopefully everyone, whether you want to work in games or movies, that you get to work in. I haven't done TV at all, um, but I think just getting experience from right. everywhere is good. You get to learn that process. And um, But it was funny. I was, at the time, I'm trying to figure out if I, I want to do movies now. I'm do a movie, yeah. And, and, I'm, and I was living in Irvine, and I'm trying to figure out if I should... if we can li- we can leave kind of our community here with some friends and all that um, to move up to maybe LA or somewhere else and kind of leave what we have. Um, so that was really tricky to try to figure out. Um, and then I remember I was I was at work and I was working on this I was working on this Crash and Eddie shot. And then I was moving one of their arms in FK and I sat back in my chair. I was like, wait a minute, I was doing this in a video game. <laughs> so. Movies and games are very different, but you're still just moving a character. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like, I think games are. St- I mean, so at that point, I think I can still. I should just go back to working on a game, and I can live in Orange County with whatever. And at the time, I think I, I'd got a bonus check, so I emailed the um I emailed the owner and owners and thanked them for it because they they didn't have to do that. I didn't even work at the company anymore. And they're really good about it. if you if you're there when you ship a game, you still get your royalties. Oh, that's cool. Unheard of. So I emailed him. I was like, oh, man, thanks. for This is awesome, right? And then he goes, hey, you know, do you have any plans after what are you going to do next? Trying to get me to come back. Uh-huh. And I, I think at the time I said, no, no, you know, I'm good. But then I, after I figured out, I think I, I want to come back to working on a game. Um, I, uh, I emailed him back and I, I said, yeah, yeah, it'd be cool to come back. So, so that's when you came back to Ready at Dawn. Yeah, in January, I came back to Ready at Dawn. Gotcha. I didn't, yeah, it's funny. So when they left, they said pulling a Kevin, leaving and trying to come back. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to come back, but I mean, it was such a good, it was such a, it was, I mean, I'm sure it is, but I mean, it was the perfect job. It was really cool. Good place. Right on. You're a senior animator at Blizzard though now. Yeah. You've been there for a bit. Three years. Yeah, okay. just three years as of this week. Working with uh, another guy, one of our instructors who we've had in a podcast, Jeremy Collins. Jeremy Collins. Yeah. Um, now, he mentioned that you kind of tend to be a little more on the technical side, at least in regards to some of your approach and workflow. Is that right? Or would you or would you describe yourself that way? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, technical as far as um, – well, there's. I know we we do the pose to pose layered stuff differently, um, but technical side, like tools. I think um, that's kind of what he was implying. Right, Wait, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I get make a, a script for this, or can I, you know, hotkey here? Or... If anything, if I don't have, if I have to click something a couple times, then I go, oh, over a lifetime, that's a million clicks, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I try to figure out how not to move too much. I think. Okay. Um, one of my. Um, I, so I never really officially did 2D, but I have this romantic view of this, this idea of 2D animation, the, the like the flipping the paper and drawing. So then I think I developed this workflow of um, posing. So what I do is I use my mouse and I pose out the character, and all my timing um, is done with my with my left hand. So I don't so like playing I'm over here on my computer here, um, but like I don't use the play button or um, using the next frame or rewind uh-huh. in the bottom controls. I'll do it all. I have hotkeys that play and stop and rewind. Um, like to select, use my mouse to select keys and, and retime. I have a hotkey that's actually built into Maya that adds in betweens and remove in between. So I'm able to retime poses quickly. So I can play, stop, rewind, retime with just a few buttons on my left hand. So that's I can just cool. hear like this. And my whole animation can play and get retimed without even touching the mouse, um, which is yeah, which is cool. But anytime I try to look up um, workflows and scripts people use and, and how to uh, hooking up um, marking menus, Maya has that built-in hotbox with um, spacebar. Right. But you can make your own marking menus and apply it to any key you want. Um, so I try to. It's like that analogy of. Like a drawing table, it's like my like a 2D, right? My paper's over here, my eraser, my pencil sharpener. Like you have your desk and your seat set up and your monitors. 
my mouse is here, right? It's all. And if you don't even like your keyboard, get a keyboard you like, right? Um, your lamp. Same with Maya. Let that <laughs> move that around and do things you need to do to make it work for you. Comfortable, right? Right. Are these a lot of the things that you teach within your class? That's a really good question. At first, I used to do it. I would do a little demo. I'd hold the camera above my keyboard and show kind of the buttons I hit. Because I back in college, I learned um, how to use Alt and period and comma, or the caret keys, to bounce between keys. And, and um, if you do the caret keys, you can bounce between key poses. And if you hold Alt, you go every frame. Uh-huh. So you can flip through your animation just by clicking Alt and period or whatever. So I like those, which is over by the enter. So in my brilliance, I took all the W, E, like the move, rotate, set key, save, and I moved them over next to those instead of moving those two (laughs) over to home base, you know, where the W, E, R is. I moved all of those other ones over. (laughs) So when I'm animating, I'm over on the alt on the right side. So my move is K, where I rotate is L, set key is J, I have a deselect on the question mark. Okay. It's so dumb. Save is P, undo is I. I have a shift, <laughs> edit does 10 undos. It's really silly. So, um, so I would show that kind of stuff. And I think, I was thinking maybe it's confusing people, like they thought, then I'd get these questions. Oh, what key did you put whatever thing on? This is, well, if you like it, then put it anywhere you want. Right, you that was the point. Put it on J. So now I'm more, I introduce it, but I think if you don't know the long way to do something, the shortcuts won't help you. Mm. So um, do vanilla Maya and learn how to animate. Just learn how to what a good pose and time, what timing is. And in, and usually until you see me do something in class, like I'll have a student, well, how did you do that? Like, ah, now you're ready to know. And then I tell them my little <laughs> secret or whatever. But then, or sometimes you show someone a shortcut and they're like, wait, why would you do that? I don't even get it. Then it's, it's kind of... Pointless they, then, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's cool though. That's a, that's a great philosophy though. At least then you understand the why behind. Yeah, the, exactly. the shortcut. I mean, I love talking about it, and I'll share just the, the kind of this, a couple I think they would really like, like the retiming or add it in between, remove in between, um, playing and stopping. And I think that's that's the only ones. And then undo. I in the hotkey editor, um, I I put I just created ten undos in a row. So if I hit shift undo, it does ten. Okay. And I learned this from my, I think I learned that from my friend Jacob. So instead of hitting undo, 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 undo you hit the next one. You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just a lot faster than when I try something out. That's why I don't do a lot of people ask about auto save. That freaks me out because sometimes when you save in my, it dumps your your undo cache. Mm. So I'll try something out and I'm like yeah, it's not working. I'll either reopen or I'll undo a bunch and then I'll kind of start over. It's kind of like erasing. Yeah. Now, has your workflow changed much throughout the year, or do you still like that kind of more traditional pose-to-pose, get your golden poses in and start working in the in-betweens? Yeah, you know, ever since I learned it at the Collective, all my buttons I've done, so I've done this key configuration for the past 10 or so years, Mm. so not really. Okay. (laughs) Which kind of freaks me out, because I'm wondering if I'm plateauing. Um. I've learned, so workflow-wise, I've learned to, um, yeah, I guess so. I learned to, what am I trying to say here, um, pick the right way early on. Like, I used to, I do a lot of pose-to-pose, like run cycles and I hit reactions or whatever, death, right, to pose it out. And once I get the key poses, I start on the root t- trans y, translate y. And I kind of refine that, and I refine the Z, and I start refining things in pieces. So it's almost layered, but I'm working with a nice, the tent poles of key poses. Okay. But when I do an idle animation, layered. Like I don't even, I do a pose in the beginning, but I'll just start doing the root up and down, and side to side. Really? And I add, oh yeah, it's completely. I call it mashed potatoes animation. <laughs> it's like there's when you look at the graph editor, there's no solid key pose. Maybe at the beginning and end. Um, maybe early on, I might, I may have tried to do pose to pose. But it's they're so doing an idol is so hard to do pose to pose. I think that it's just easier to do layered the whole way. Okay. But like on a run, I would I don't think I'd ever like there's guys that do like up and down and then they do the root and but 
it's hard to know how long the legs need to be in the heat, right, and how high and low you need to go. I mean, yeah. I, I'm just not that good, I guess, to do that. Um, but it is fun to um, to try things out because I think it helps you. And that's where I think students, where I was blocking students was, oh, do th- work like this. And then they have to kind of get in this awkward configuration and, like, try to work. But if you just concentrate on, I need to build something cool, and I'll just use whatever I need to use to make it look good. So sometimes forgetting your – it's like sometimes a mouse or I'm going to use a tablet. I, I picked up a 13-inch Cintiq on eBay, so I'm using this to work with, um, which is a, <coughs> excuse me, which has been a lot of fun to kind of draw-ish on the screen and pose out. So that kind of changes things up a bit. Okay. Now, I've noted uh, there was some time back, I forget how long ago, you actually did a, a short test with one of our rigs. Oh, what, yeah, the George Stevens. George Stevens, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It was a cool test, very cool test. Um, Jeremy Collins, he did a test with one of our characters, Marty. In the podcast with Jeremy, he mentioned something along the lines of there was kind of an epiphany for him that he realized that it's not necessarily your employer – or your work that's going to make you get better. And, and is that something you find for yourself as well? That was, that's, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And it, I, let's see, I don't know if I figured, if I figured that or I heard it. Um, so Chuck, my, my buddy from the collective and he's at uh, Kings Isle now in Texas. And he used to say, it's called work. It's not called awesome. (laughs) <laughs> he, he and it's just like it's just like any job and it's this tricky part to talk to students about because you want to inspire them and we all want to this is like uh gumdrops and rainbows or something right it's yeah you're in an animator but it's still it's essentially it's commercial art you you get into this thing because you like to draw or you like to animate but you're if you get a job doing it you're doing it for someone else so um that's one thing I learned. And I think I learned that back in college, commercial, this whole thing of commercial art. It freaked me out. What is commercial art? Um, but yeah, I think in, and I've talked to people at work about this too. And it is really tricky when someone's having a hard time with something or when I'm having a hard time, you can just come out and say, Oh yeah, yeah come on, man. It's work. Just get it done. It's like, you, we got to be gentle even with, the, even with ourselves that, um, that is, but that is true. I'm, I'm rambling here. Because <laughs> uh, work, you're hired to get something done. Um, hopefully, you can have your own fingerprint on it or have your idea, whatever. But oftentimes, you don't, and they need you to animate that thing this certain way. Um, sometimes you're like, just put your hand on my hand and move my mouse, right? It, sometimes it gets to that. Usually, it doesn't. But there's, you know, that happens. So. At those times, you have to say, okay, I'm working for somebody else. This is their project. This is their money, and they need me to do a job with, with my skill set, and and that's just the thing I have to understand. And then you can always go home and um, do whatever you want. It's like one of the things I, I talk about um, at the last class, kind of what to do. It's like what to do after class. It's like um, or how to continue with education or, or with animation is uh, if you want to, like, animate a dragon or be a guitar player or something, chances are if you chase something you want to do for a job, you either won't get it exactly what you want or you get it, but you won't like it because you want to be a guitar player, but you have to play this song. Like, I don't like this song. Or you want to be a painter, so you try to get a job to be a painter, but then you have to do something. Or you might never get a job being a painter or something or whatever. Um so if you want to be a painter or you want to play guitar, just play guitar. Just paint. You might not get paid for it, but... Uh, you're doing something you enjoy. You're still, yeah, you're doing something you enjoy. So, I mean, hopefully we can all get jobs and support ourselves with something we love to do. Right. Um, but, I mean, it's... But to push oneself, that's where you got to do that, the extra. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can't... Exactly. You can't... Ex- exactly what I said. You can't expect them to give you stuff you want to do. Or um, make you better. If you think you're plateauing, um, maybe not leave your job. <laughs> that's, that's tricky. But seek out, talk to people, and try to draw or, or animate at home. Or, and I think a lot of that, if, 
we make excuses. I, I think I'm a firm believer on um, if you we do think we have enough time for things we really want to do. Uh-huh. Like, oh, I just don't have time. I got kids. Like, well, do you watch TV tonight or are you? I really want to read. Like, what would you do last night? It's like, oh, I watch TV. It's like, why don't you not watch TV? Yeah, there you go. Maybe you don't want to read, right? So, and sometimes we're too tired or we don't, I don't have a computer to even animate at home. It's like, well, maybe save up, stop eating out or something. I mean, right, right. You know, you can have some tough conversations about, you know, how to, how to get, go about, but I think until you're really wanting to push yourself is where you can start having those. Um, hard conversations. Oh, it's good stuff. Very yeah. Cool. I ramble a lot. No, that's good. I, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> My wife says, uh, "If you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how to make a clock." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's totally right. <laughs> right. Well, well, then our students are getting our, their money's worth with your classes, huh? Oh yeah, my two-hour right. <laughs> I'm horrible at ending. <laughs> Um, okay, here's a question for you then, because you're talking about working on other people's stuff here. What advice would you give um, as an artist getting stuff done on time? Because that's not always easy. Because I, I, you know, I found for myself sometimes it's like, well, if I just I, I can tweak this here, or I can do that there, you know. And sometimes it's hard to get uh, to work within that time frame. Yeah. Um... Yeah, a lot of time. I think they say animation. You're never done. You just run out of time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, it, it all. I think a lot of it depends on. Um, let's see. Where you work. So Ready at Dawn was awesome because we were doing a lot of new things for the company and and like oh yeah I'm gonna animate a cyclops or a big sea creature like and it's supposed to look awesome so I'm gonna have to work. 90 hours this week to get it done. <laughs> so you have that. You can get something done on time. Your question was how to get it done on time. Right. So you can get something done on time by working 90 hours. But if, let's say, you're an hourly employee and you can't work, you have to only work 40 hours and you have three days. This is where workflow comes into play. So you look at what you have to do, uh, how long you have, and... Um, you kind of put those together. So if they say you have two days and you can't work overtime, like, well, it's going to look not awesome. So, um, and hopefully that's understandable. This is why TV animation, right? They do 2000 or a thousand frames a week. Uh, it's not like it's bad. I mean, there's bad TV animation, but there's good for TV and there's, there's good for movies and there's good for games. So you, you've tried to figure out the bar you need to reach and then hopefully you're in that kind of bracket. Um, I think when you look at I, your idea, like let's say, and I think you you um, divvy out, like you have a certain amount of time. Um, that means I have this much time to shoot reference, I have this much time to plan, this much time to block it out and get approvals. But if you have like a month, then that planning time can grow. But if you have one day, my planning might be a half an hour, and I just have to blast through it. So, so yeah, dividing up your time and then keeping your animation, like if it's an animation, making sure, like if you're doing 100 frames, that you don't just concentrate on 10 frames, that you're kind of, it's like broad strokes. You're kind of doing the whole thing. You're blocking the whole thing. You're refining the whole thing. You're starting to polish the whole thing. So any time you have to stop, at least it's all the same quality. Okay. That one thing's not overdone. <laughs> the other part's not even done. I mean, that's really but I think it just comes down to workflow. Maybe okay. practicing. This is always um, have a friend tell you what to do and how much time to do it in, and then see if you can do it. Mm. Um, and see what it's like. I got to do a run cycle. I have to do a run cycle in four hours, and I have to. I, and now I have one. I have a week to do one, and see, uh, you know, how different they are. You work in that time frame, yeah. yeah. And then eventually you get better. I think you just get faster. Hotkeys that help out um, a lot. Good notes help out. Not having to start over. Hopefully you're. Your supervisor understands, and they don't want to go like, "Oh, make it with the left hand." Like, <laughs> hand. That, hopefully, that doesn't happen. Um, this is kind of a random question, but since you've dealt with games for quite some time here, what's your thoughts on VR? VR is ridiculous. Have you done it before? Not yet. 
<laughs> it is. So we have some guys at work that have VR, and it is. And I did this this one game. But they, it was the vibe. So you stand. Okay. Man, I pl- it was like shooting these things in the air, and I took it off, and I was like, I felt like I was back on Earth. It was crazy. Really. So it's funny. I have this joke at work that I have this weird. I have this scary problem with it that I'll. Like, I'll, I'll be, pl- like, if I ever get one, I'll be in my room in this whole crazy world, like, the sound, and it's like I'm there. And then my wife will come in, it's like, hey, it's time for whatever. And then I'm in this, like, wife beater shirt with, like, pizza stains and like, <laughs> beard. Like, there's this crazy disconnect of reality. <laughs> I mean, just like anything, just like you can work too much or whatever, right? <laughs> Anything in excess can be pretty bad. Right, right. Drink too much water for crying out loud. But, <laughs> uh, but I think that kind of freaks me out. I read this book called Ready Player One that I highly recommend. It's a really good book, um, especially if you're into VR, you play MMOs. Uh, it kind of shows kind of what the future could be like with this. Maybe not exactly. They were trying to make a movie out of it, um, this VR stuff, which is cool. But I me mean, online already has like a very fake presence so now we add vr to it it's gonna be but i mean it's cool <laughs> I, I, yeah i think augmented reality might be a bigger set i mean i think somehow that might be a bigger deal okay With vr you, you put this thing on you're very locked down and you can't see anything you trip over your own feet but ar augmented reality at least you can like the google whatever goggles or something uh-huh. at least you can see and then it creates little creatures and like you can you be at a table with three other friends playing like kind of an electronic board game. You're each seeing the same stuff, but it's all in 3D. You can see each other and you're seeing like, whoa, I can look over in this. And you hit this like little character and they walk over and they kill their other character like a little animation. Okay, like from Star Wars uh, on the Millennium exactly. Falcon. That's exactly. Yeah, okay. I, might be. I'm not. I'm not like this visionary person, but. Just the fact that you can even pick up water and drink. I mean, that's... But in VR, you can't, but... Yeah. Uh, I think you hit upon something, though. The idea that everything in moderation... Because I think it's real easy to look at the extreme and go, okay, this is, you know... But I think if you keep it within moderation, it puts a different perspective right. on things. So and I was just kind of curious. And it's tricky, too, because you might be playing a game. I was just talking to a guy who's playing a co-worker... He said he started playing Overwatch at nine and then it ended at three in the morning. Oh wow! That's so easy to do. But yeah, that's easy to do without VR though. I remember without VR, but with VR, oh my gosh, it is a whole other. And it's tricky to really explain until you try it. Okay. That's I think once you try it, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this is ridiculous. So it oh, just yeah. puts you in a whole new world. Oh, literally. Okay, that's interesting. I saw I mean a driving game like you're sitting in a drive and um, with the vibe you're it, it knows your kind of place so you can move around so you're not only in a car driving and you're looking around but you can like lean over and see the road and look behind you I mean it's that's oh, interesting okay it, yeah I play this game called Elite Dangerous where you sit it was like a spaceship game and that's playing on a PC it's pretty fun but when you sit with, with VR when you're in this cockpit and you're like looking around in this huge space station it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> Looking down inside the ship, it's it's awesome. That's pretty cool. But yeah, I don't. I'm I'm not sure. It's. I'm having. Okay. A, plus, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. Certain systems, right? Though. Um. Uh, yeah, I think I don't know. It, yeah, it's like seven hundred bucks. Plus, you'd have. I don't. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, it's totally worth it. And then, um, and the graphics card. I think it would cost me like thirteen hundred bucks to get it. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> the after. Yeah. Yeah, I'll loan it to you virtually here. And it's so weird to have like a, I think it's essentially, it's a cell phone just attached to your face. It's mm-hmm. a other weird thing too. <laughs> um, what do you enjoy in teaching here at iAnimate? Hmm. Because you've been with us for quite some time now. Yeah, I think 2012. Yeah. Called me up. Um, teaching has been... Well, first, oh man, why? What do you even start? Everything. Um, that's it. Everything. Oh, okay, so okay, this. Is, oh man, how do I even start? <laughs> One thing I, I really like 
animation. Since I was, like I said, ever since I was a 12 year old, I wanted to animate, right? And games are, are fun. I'm not, I wouldn't, like I said earlier, I wouldn't call myself a gamer. Like, I don't like every game that comes out. But, like, I, I use, I love driving games. Um, Elite Dangerous, I put plenty of hours into that. So Which I think one? This, Elite Dangerous, that, that flying one, the okay. space game. Um, and even, <laughs> there's a game called Euro Truck Simulator that, I mean, you're driving a truck, it's so silly, but it's actually really fun. <laughs> um, uh, Overwatch, I mean, that's, that's been fun to play, it's new. Um, uh, so, because I, I like all these kind of things, it's, it's been fun to kind of talk about it with other people. Uh-huh. Um, and I didn't really know this at the time, but when I took the job, but to be able to take what you do and put it into words and teach someone else how to do it, it really makes, I think it makes you better at whatever you do. So for me with animation and po- like I do a thing in my first couple classes, we do just posing and we take a character in all an F- all FK skeleton and I have them pose a re- action character. Now it's really easy to do because you have IK, but when we do this with FK, you have to actually literally touch every control. It's like a figure drawing. Uh-huh. Um, Samantha Yosef, Yosef, uh-huh. she talked about this with CG, 2D, and um, 3D. And this is one of the reasons why I do this this assignment. She said, in hand, when you're drawing 2D or figure drawing, and you forget to draw a hand, you don't have a hand. But in computer animation, if you forgot to pose the hand, you still have a hand, but it just won't be moving. Uh-huh. How many times have we animated a, a walk cycle and forgot? You know, you look at the curves on the shoulder, like, uh oh, they're flat. And you, <laughs> hit it back and you have to kind of reanimate. Um, so this FK assignment, it makes them, and it has to be action, like a lot of, I take like a soccer, like a passing position on a soccer pose. You have to bend the root and rotate the root, and you have to bend the foot and the leg and even the toe. So, I mean, you wouldn't animate this way, but at least it adds makes a, you think. It makes you think and focus on every every aspect. So when you are animating, you're moving the root down, and you have an FK foot, you might not... You ask yourself, should the FK foot just stay there, or should it bend maybe a little bit? His feet never stay flat when you move. And even just talking about it right now, it's just fun to... <laughs> so just that, for me, it's been really fun. That's cool. And it, it's cool because I think I've been... I've had some really good instructors and teachers... I, through officially through school, but also Jacob and Paul, um, even Ed. I learned some awesome stuff with Ed. He was the animation director at the collective. Um, it's I've I've learned so much stuff. So it's like a pay it forward. I mean, I don't have secrets. If I know something, it's I've been blessed enough to learn it. So if I tell you, maybe you could take it and think I'm an idiot, and then you can make your own stuff. I mean, that's it's been it's that's the fun part too. Is is um kind of I, looking at the Disney books and all the movies I've watched or whatever and grabbed info from, then I can just kind of spit it back out. And hopefully someone can take that and then kind of grow as an animator and artist and a person. So that's, I think that's maybe the main the main reason why I enjoy it. Very cool. I love meeting people. I think at CTN has been awesome. I love going there. Yeah, yeah for sure. People going out to lunch and, you know, Jason, they do the the at the bar at night, and you get to hang out with the people. Uh-huh. That's been a lot of fun. And I have students from France and all, I mean, all over the place. Yeah, uh, uh, CTN's a blast. That's that's the annual get together. It's a mu- and it's I'm so close that it's it's been. Well, I mean, and and you come up from Bakersfield, so I mean, I have no excuse. Yeah. <laughs> Larry can make it. Anyone can. Make it. <laughs> Any hobbies you like doing? I know you play the guitar and yeah, I play guitar. Um, I've been getting into reading more. I, I was like I said, I didn't do an SAT in high school. Um, Any nor, favorite books right now? Nor did I read books. Um, um, I was reading The Fountain or Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, her philosophy is kind of dumb, but it's an interesting book. Like, you know, we had an Odyssey, like a lot of classics. I love classics. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Steinbeck and old like Shakespeare, even that a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, right on. Get into. That's awesome. I read more books out of college than I ever read in my probably my education career. Oh yeah, that probably was, within the first couple of years after I just you didn't have to do it or, yeah. or read it or write a paper on it. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I, there's so many classics I would love to be able to put into animated movies. Oh yeah, that totally. aren't. Um, and then I have a motor. I have a motorcycle. It's fun to ride. Um, kids that keep me. There busy. you go, wife and kids. That'll keep you. Kids. Keep your priorities there. Yeah. Very cool, Kevin. Well, I really do appreciate your time. Um, love what you do and here at iAnimate. And uh, you've taught Games Workshop one and two. Is that what you typically? Uh, I one. I've done. I did uh, Workshop two. I think just a couple of times. Okay. But I've been doing Workshop one for a couple of years now. Right. Right. All right. So anybody who's looking to jump into the games arena here, come take a course with Kevin. Yeah, you'll learn some good stuff. That's right. That's right. All right, Kevin. Well, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. It's been fun. Thanks.